Um, this is a sort of talk based on Merton during um, World War Two. Uh, this is obviously the experience for a lot of people around the country and in Merton about how they heard about the outbreak of war, listening to the sort of famous um, broadcast by Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain announcing that Britain was at war with Germany on the 3rd of September in 1939. Um, and after the horrific experiences of World War I and rapid developments in aircraft technology, there was a real fear of a potential for gas attack on the UK during World War II. So there were needs for safety precautions and the wholesale of distribution of gas masks to the British population. So locally, as in many areas, at the outbreak of war, the ARP and the Women's Voluntary Service issued thousands of gas masks. Um, rather unusual distribution method here in Wimbledon. You can see the, the ARP um, officers using the a sort of old pram to actually wheel the boxes of gas masks around to distribute them. But to give you an idea of the scale of this operation, up to 67,000 gas masks were distributed in Mitcham alone. Um, and there were special fitting centres because obviously it was important for um, correct sizing and allocation of gas masks. So you had a sort of snug fit around your face to stop the penetration of any gas. Um, and it, it was particularly important, not just for a safe seal, but for a comfortable fit if these were going to be worn for, for lengthy periods during raids. Stand, most what people don't didn't necessarily realise at the time was a standard adult gas mask in its sort of distinctive cardboard box had actually asbestos in the filter. Um, of those sort of gas masks. If you still have any of your gas masks around as a family thing, please be aware of that because there can be a safety issue. Um, many small children obviously found heavy rubbery masks alarming. Um, this is a little one being sort of fitted through the gas mask at a distribution centre in Wimbledon. And this is a recollection from a lady in Mitcham called Irene Bain. She said a man had come to the house with our gas masks. What a nasty rubbery smell they had. They had their own small square brown cardboard box and were to be taken with us wherever we went. There was a string for a strap and we carried them over our shoulders. And there was also a Mickey Mouse version created in sort of more colourful red and blue rubber with a nose flap. This apparently made a very satisfying raspberry sound when air passed through it. The idea of that being that it would sort of be something that would distract and make the children laugh and try to lessen their sort of fears of, of sort of um, being confined in masks for lengthy raids. There was also a baby's gas helmet with a side pump. Um, this little one from Morden actually looks quite unperturbed. You'd be smiling inside that. Um, but there was a sort of potential for sort of steam build up in those. They had a sort of strap that went through the legs to keep the child inside. And there was actually a genuine fear on the part of many um, women that during long raids, they'd be unable to keep pumping. You can see that sort of side pump at the side. They were worried they'd be unable to keep pumping for long enough and were sort of frightened that their children would, would suffocate. Um, people were encouraged to keep their masks with them at all times. Um, these are some of the good ladies of Wimbledon queuing at a sort of gas decontamination centre at Queen's Road School in Wimbledon. Um, and many people started to actually decorate hat boxes and bags as sort of special creations to make their gas masks look less dull or incongruous when they were travelling around the streets. This is, you can see sort of um, air patrol members on Wimbledon Common here and service issue gas masks were slightly more heavy duty. Um, with their own carry pack and eye protectors um, designed for long use by those out in the streets during a raid. And gas drills were organised by the local civil defence. Um, here you can see people practising how to sort of smother gas bombs. Um, they use things like sort of smoke for demonstration purposes. And there was also a special mobile gas van for practice runs on the use of masks um, and the provision of mobile gas decontamination units um, with, which went um, from the local authorities with special training. Now, shelters were obviously going to be particularly important during the war, war as well. Um, many people are less aware of the fact that um, during the First World War, we'd actually started to have experience of air raids with sort of terrifying Zeppelin raids that took place over many British cities um, between 1914 and 1918, including Wimbledon. Um, however, the, the latter development of long range bombers led to fears of widespread air raids. And there were a series of air raid precautions and protective measures undertaken. Um, government circulars were issued to defence services and local authorities, um, and it was important to organise the, the sort of prompt provision of shelter. So lorries distributed corrugated metal sheets to households to allow construction of Anderson shelters. This involved a deep hole being dug in the back garden, and the sheets were fitted together to create a dome structure, which was then bolted together and fixed at the ends with, with steel plates. 
any gaps were filled with rags or, or papier mache. And then, as you can see in the, the example on the left there, these were earthed over for strength and to disguise the shelter. Many people actually grew vegetables and flowers over the top. Um, now bunks, the, the sort of inside of the shelters could actually be very cold and, and it could be quite damp in there. Bunks were often fitted in some shelters for use during um, long air raids. These are some shelters that were actually um, dug at the Johnny's Horticultural Institute in Merton Park to allow sort of protection for a lot of the sort of staff working there, doing very important work developing sort of um, strong horticultural crops to, to feed the population. And this gives you an idea of the interior of an Anderson shelter. You can see the, the sort of rags and things there actually filling the gaps in that particular um, shelter to make them more um, airtight. Um, and people would oft, of, often use candles or hurricane lamps as the one shown there um, to actually provide light um, in the blackout. Um, at the top of that photo, you can see a, a little sort of um, china basin that might have had a candle, but I've also been told that people actually used those with a candle underneath upended on a plate apparently to provide some heat it was actually possible to build up enough heat apparently to actually heat a sort of little pan of soup or something like that for for meals during long raids um, you would often have blackout fabric at the door of your shelter office it's important not to, to allow any light out that could be seen from the air for by enemy planes and neighbors often shared self shelters some also sheltered in cellars and under the stairs which was often the strongest part of the house in the event of a direct hit um, as you can see with, with this sort of um, picture, whoever was living here in this particular part of Collierswood was quite um, fortunate because their Anderson shelter had actually protected them from blast damage, but they, they wouldn't withstand a sort of direct hit. In March 1941, Morrison shelters were introduced. Um, Herbert Morrison was the Home Secretary at the time and gave his name to these. It was like a cross between a bed and a table. Uh, there was a wire frame fixed to corner supports with steel plates at the top and the base and one side would be raised to allow for the entry of up to two to three people and they were very good at withstanding damage and the risk of falling masonry but could obviously be quite claustrophobic people were warned not to take feather eider downs or pillows into a morrison shelter because in the event of a blast they risk being suffocated if the pillow exploded and they were sort of surrounded by by lots of um, flying feathers um, people were quite, you can see, people would sort of disguise their Morrison shelter with a sort of tablecloth and use them for having meals on um, during the daytime. Some of them even turned them into table tennis tables. Um, you also had public shelters constructed um, between the streets. These were initially planned for emergency use only, where people were stranded away from home and away from their own shelter during a raid. Um, but use increased rapidly, particularly during the Blitz, as you can imagine. Um, partly due to space and, the, and, and greater sort of dryness, often a lot of, of a lot of the sort of public shelters, as opposed to some of the Anderson shelters, which were often sunk below the sort of floodplain and could get quite sort of damp. Um, and also partly due to the morale boast of actually being inside a shelter with other people if you were scared. Um, they had deep foundations and concrete supports. And this is a, a sort of recollection again from Irene Bain. She said about public shelters being dug all over Mitcham. She said, we had several in Sherwood Park School in the grounds for the children and teachers. And when the air raid warning went, we would file out in an orderly way with our teacher, class by class, down to the shelters. We spent many hours down there in total. We would sing songs, play the whispering telephone game, or just sit and wait for the raid to finish. And sadly, the brick service shelter that you can see here um, some of them have problems with structural weakness um, and this one on Cricket Green actually suffered a direct hit unfortunately and a small child was actually killed um, and lots of the inhabitants were, were injured by falling bricks. We also had shelters at a lot of the sort of local businesses, this is one at an electricity station um, at Dernsford Road. And also, um, as the war progressed, people started to use the local underground stations, which were obviously much deeper for, for sheltering. Um, so this is um, this is actually our, a post-war picture, but this is showing the, the disassembly of some of the sort of bunk beds that had actually been um, fixed at South Wimbledon Tube Station. Um, so there's more formal organisation after as the Blitz started of underground shelters. So there'd be toilet facilities, bunk beds, um, tea ladies providing a hot drink and a bun. Um, people would get platform tickets um, to, to use a designated amount of space. But obviously there was still some risk. Some of you may have seen the sort of um, quite horrifying picture of the, the sort of Ballam tube station where there was a, a sort of bomb blast from above. You actually had a, a bus that went into part of the blast crater. 
and also the bomb actually then um, penetrated the, the sort of water pipes underneath. So those people that weren't injured by the blast, quite a lot of them unfortunately were drowned as the, the sort of water rose and also some people were crushed in the event of, of panic. Um, fear, eventually fear of long raids and the number of raids also um, affected public morale to the point that some people stubbornly refused to actually go to their sort of shelters and decided that if they were going to, um, you know, if, if fate decreed they were going to suffer a direct hit, at least they were going to die in their beds. But um, it was very important that people did have some sort of formal protection. Another important aspect of wartime organisation, both locally and nationally, was um, sorting out the safety of um, children in the, across the country. And there was government concern about the risk of wholesale bombing raids across British cities. So evacuation was organised for, for children and vulnerable people. And this was the largest movement of civilians in British history, a lot of which took place during the first weeks of September 1939, when over two million people were actually um, transferred to different locations. They were billeted with host families um, who would pay a, an allowance. There was a phony war period at the start of the war um, when some youngsters actually returned home thinking that there weren't going to be air raids. Um, but the horrors of the Blitz and later vengeance weapons confirmed the parental belief in the need for evacuation. And this picture that I'm showing you here um, relates to the early part of the war when a lot of people were evacuated to, or children I should say, were evacuated to America, Canada, South Africa and Australia to be billeted with relatives and host families. This practice actually changed um, in 1940 when this ship, um, the cargo ship City of Benares, which is one of the transport ships used to transport evacuation parties, um, was sadly torpedoed by a German U-boat. Um, and a large number of four, you know, 400 passengers and crew were trapped below deck. Um, the nearest Allied units were over 300 miles away and 255 people drowned or died from exposure, including 77 evacuees. And this had such an effect on public morale that actually ended seaborne evacuation to the America. So they then become, started a much more formal programme of evacuation by school where children were sent to the countryside and the coast, away from the dangers of cities. So evacuees include children, pregnant women and young mothers, and they journeyed by bus and train. Um, here you can see the, the sort of list, this is a photograph from a local school, you can see the list of essential items, so gas masks, clothing and snacks. Um, drinks discouraged for, for fairly obvious reasons, you don't want to be sort of trapped on a train where you, you can't get access to toilet facilities and so forth. And here you can see an evacuation party setting off for Wimbledon from Wimbledon County School for girls. A lot of the teachers went to help organise um, the, the evacuees in their sort of um, billets and the locations where they were transferred to. Uh, this is, I love this picture. It's kind of a bittersweet picture. This is some little evacuees from queuing at Wimbledon Station. And you can see the range of expressions. Some of them look frightened. Some of them are quite cheery. They've got their little sort of labels um, pinned around them and their, their sort of gas masks carried with them. Um, despite the evacu scale of the operation, the evacu evacuation procedures still adhered to requirements for wartime secrecy. So road signs were removed, station signs were obscured, and the destination where children were going to was kept secret to ensure safety and security. Um, the government controlled the reporting of the evacuation process. Um, and it was a very sort of mixed um, situation for, for children. Some people from quite poor backgrounds, children from quite poor backgrounds ended up being billeted with people at sort of, you know, large, wealthy country homes. Others went from quite comfortable homes to, to sort of living with sort of elderly people in, in sort of rural or coastal areas who, who either hadn't had children and weren't used to looking after them or were sort of living in quite spartan conditions. So a very sort of mixed experience on the part of evacuees. And this is another picture of a little one. This is Diana Colt of a little baby in the, the sort of um, carrying um, basket there with, with um, I think I suspect a father being taken out to a sort of evacuation as part of an evacuation party. And to give you an idea of the impact of evacuation on, on little ones, this is another of Irene Bain's um, recollections. Should our school Sherwood Park was to be evacuated, mother bought thick white canvas and made two large shoulder bags, one for my brother and one for me. Into these bags were packed all the clothing necessary for our new life. With the large bags over our shoulders and me carrying my beloved teddy bear, we were loaded onto buses. Then the mothers and fathers waving us goodbye. The convoy of Red London buses packed with children set off. We knew not where. 
It was dark when we were taken into the local hall, now packed with children in the centre and grown-ups standing on all sides. People began picking out the children they wanted and the crowd thinned a little. Eventually, four of us girls were taken by a gentleman helper in his little car and personally delivered to foster parents on the edge of town. My friend Jean and I were taken up to a front door. When the lady of the house opened the door, she was told she could pick which child she wanted. She chose Jean, which was not a very nice feeling for me. So experiences of evacuees very sort of varied. Um, here you can see some of them. Um, cleanliness and hygiene, an important part of maintaining public health during wartime. These are some of the evacuations out in one of their sort of evacuees out in one of their rural retreats. Um, so some children were traumatised by separation from parents and siblings and the culture shock of um, different surroundings. Um, this is some of the evacuees out having sort of outdoor lessons. So sometimes they were accommodated with the, the children and the classes in schools of the local area. In other instances, they actually had to have outdoor lessons like this because there simply wasn't the space available to accommodate all the extra um, child input. Um, Irene Bain says, I think people thought children from London would be poorly dressed, as indeed some of them were, often arriving in layers of all the clothes they possessed and sometimes very dirty. I was certainly expected to have a Cockney accent. Some South children, London children only had one set of clothes and there might have been resentment from foster parents who had to close, clothe them using precious, precious rations. Uh, this is also an official government um, piece of documentation because although in some instances parents were actually able to make occasional visits to see their children, you can imagine this was very much dis discouraged as, un as were unnecessary journeys and, and fuel supplies were limited. So moving on, on to another aspect of wartime life, that was rationing. Um, by the start of the war, Britain was already importing a surprisingly large amount of food um, from across the British Empire. And a fair system was needed to ensure that everyone was fed. Also to counteract the problems of um, you know, U-boat attacks on imported food, um, reducing the amount of food available. So this gives you an idea of the, the sort of adult um, ration for one week. Um, ration books were, were provided to everyone and people were registered with specific shopkeepers for particular weekly rations, so eggs, fat, cheese, meat, tea, sugar and milk. There was also a point system of 16 to 20 points per month for additional perks such as jam, tinned fruit, chocolate and tinned fish. Bread was mainly wholemeal um, as the war progressed as there was little white flour and there were also national milk and supplements provided for young children, pregnant and nursing mothers. Um, and this is a recollection um, from a gentleman called Michael Wood, who lived in Collier's Wood. He said, during and after the war, rationing was very strict until it finished around 1952. My parents who owned a shop had quotas allotted to them of sweets, paper and cigarettes. The cigarettes were kept under the counter and sold to regular customers only. Even if you had the money, it was still difficult to find a shop who would sell you any. Many arguments came of this practice by customers who never believed you when you said, sorry, mate, sold out. The rationing after the war was actually worse. The milk allowance was reduced to two and a half pints a week. Newspapers had four pages and bread was rationed. Um, you can see here Laurel and Hardy was a number of sort of um, stars of stage and screen that were sort of brought in um, by the Ministry of Food to um, advise people on their rations and how to make the best use of them, including sort of radio broadcast by Gert and Daisy, um, who provided, um, in addition to their sort of usual sort of chatter and, and normal programming, also provided sort of in inserted recipes and helpful sort of ration using hints into their broadcasts. Um, and there were WVS kitchens at Portman Court um, in London who were responsible for safeguarding public nutrition. And they um, trained um, WVS um, representatives to go out into the sort of home counties um, to actually show people how to use their rations more effectively. There were also Norwegian chefs um, in their experimental kitchens who started working out how to use things like whale meat and also something called snooks, which some of you may remember. Um, so to sort of devise alternative forms of food like sort of whale meat sausages, which I'm told weren't very good. But also food parcels from overseas. I'll show you a picture related to that in a moment. Um, queues would form um, as rationing the war progressed. Queues would form outside local shops. Uh, this is a, a much missed um, butcher's shop gardeners in Arthur Road in Wimbledon Park. You can see there is a sort of queue because a rumour started that eggs had arrived. So if, if people saw a queue, they joined it just in case something might be um, available. 
Uh, I was talking about sort of food parcels from overseas. This is actually um, ladies visiting the British Legion headquarters in Morden um, after a consignment of Australian tinned fruit and jam and Natco corned beef had arrived to be distributed to local housewives. There was also spam, um, sort of a cross between pork and, and ham. Um, it, which came in tins and dried egg that could be used for, for sort of baking and, and mixing up the equivalent of, of sort of um, an egg if you hadn't got fresh eggs available. We also had a lot of um, British restaurants established um, around our borough. So this is one of them. This is the Fire Top British restaurant in Mitcham. Um, and there was this, a network of these established throughout the country, especially in urban areas where thousands of hot meals um, were provided for those who were stranded by air raids, people who wanted company, or those who were simply unable to face the culinary challenges of rationing. Um, so it's a, a sort of institution like this, an adult meal might cost around nine pence, um, and a child's meal would be four pence. And they were very energy efficient because people were pooling fuel resources. A lot of them were, were sort of had catering facilities run by the Women's Voluntary Service. And they were particularly important, you see quite a few children in this picture, they were particularly important for children whose mothers were doing war work. Um, there was another um, British restaurant in Morgan Congregational Church that actually had patriotic murals painted by John Piper, who was a student from the Slade School of Art. And there was also one um, in the Merton area, which had scenes of Merton Priory. Um, also, allotments encouraged uh, any sort of uh, vacant space, so parks, um, rail embankments, gardens, very much open common land. So Wimbledon, sections of Wimbledon Common and Mitchin Common used for actually cultivating um, vegetables to actually supplement the, the local rations. Even some of the sort of beautifully manicured um, lawns of Wimbledon All England Lawn Tennis Club were actually used to support the, the sort of Dig for Victory campaign. And local firms like this is Carter's Tested Seed, some of you may have remembered from um, Rains Park. Um, they weren't necessarily so directly involved with sort of producing um, better vegetables for the human population, but they did um, specialise in producing mangle whirls all during the war to provide um, animal feed to actually sort of help local farmers and that type of thing. And youngsters were also encouraged to contribute to the war effort by supporting the salvage campaign. Um, you, in addition to food rationing, you had clothes rationing, so you had um, requirements put in that you were to be no large hems on skirts or trousers, no large trouser turnips, wide collars or darts in, clo in, in clothing. Um, and people were encouraged to make do and mend. So there are a whole lot of sort of um, fashion um, patterns were produced by key designers, including Norman Hartnell, who used to dress um, Her Majesty the Queen, I think during the 1950s. Uh, but they, they were actually um, used to show people how to recycle clothing, curtain fabric and all sorts of things to actually um, supplement the sort of provision of clothing. So jumpers would be taken apart and they could be re-knitted. Um, clothes could be sort of uh, altered and given to, to sort of younger people. And there's also parachute silk from any sort of um, parachutes that, that came down or from, from sort of um, defence sites could actually be pounced upon for the silk to actually use to be converted into to sort of clothing. There was all the sort of, also a story, I don't know how widely this was practised, but um, in the absence of stockings, some um, fashionable young ladies would actually use gravy browning um, to actually try and simulate the appearance of stockings, uh, which was posed a particular threat I suspect if you had a family dog you might have to try and keep away from you and you might have seen from um, some of the sort of films that have been produced about life in London during the second world war um, there's little what I think hope and glory is one of my favorite ones of those where a sort of teenage sister is having a, a eyeliner pencil used to actually pencil the the equivalent of a seam down the back of her legs by a young brother to give the appearance of, of stockings Petrol was also rationed for and primarily used for emergency vehicles and service vehicles. Um, and I've got a picture here for the sort of salvage campaign. So this was part of a government campaign to boost morale by involving everyone in the war effort, regardless of age. So children participated by collecting scrap metal for munitions. Um, unwanted clothing was um, used for reissue and food scraps were collected for animal feed. Um, and metal was also collected from garden railings, pots and pans, old bicycles, and even bed frames were recycled um, for the war effort. It has to be said, some of this, this is actually a sort of assembly of, of scrap metal at Garth Road Council Depot. Some of this in practice was actually more for morale than actual practical purposes. A lot of it was reused, um, but some of it was more for the mental benefits of people feeling as if they were actually contributing to the war effort. 
And civil defense and war work was sort of particularly important um, during the war for, for Merton and other parts of the country. Um, so you had local police um, very much involved together with the ARP in enforcing the blackout. If you look um, at this picture of this police sergeant in his back garden in Dorset Road, you can see the crisscrosses of tape um, across the windows there to, to sort of lessen the risk of blast damage in the event of an air raid. Um, you've got the air raid siren there as well on the top of Mitcham Police Station. So people were encouraged to put heavy blackout fabric up at their windows at night time to prevent um, the, the risk of properties being seen or from, from sort of enemy planes flying overhead. Um, you also had um, local people of all ages were encouraged to support the war efforts, and that included youngsters. You can see some of these sort of um, Wimbledon air cadets here who were actually serving as cycle messengers during the war. Um, they, some of those had quite a hairy time actually cycling between civil defence posts during air raids because the only protection they had was that little sort of tin helmet that you can see there. Um, you also had um, the ARP themselves, so this is one of the sort of local air raid wardens posts um, in Mitcham Park, this was christened Fort Bailey, um, and the air raid wardens would, would um, obviously support people in the event of air raids, they would announce the air raids, they had those sort of um, rattles that were also used at football matches in, in later years um, to announce air raids in addition to the air raid siren, um, they would go around making sure that the blackout was being observed, they would various parts of the civil defence were involved in everything from sort of rescue parties and gas decontamination to the auxiliary ambulance service, the home guard, um, the auxiliary fire service. So I can show you some pictures of those. Um, these are some of the sort of rescue workers from the, the local um, civil defence at a site in Richmond Avenue in, in Merton um, in September 1940, following the sort of downing of a German Junkers plane, uh, which crashed, crashed near the Nelson Hospital site. And here you can see some of the heavy rescue um, workers in High Park in South Wimbledon. So in addition to actually helping people to escape from, from bomb damaged properties, they were also um, involved in actually securing properties, trying to prevent any further sort of deterioration of, of sort of falling masonry and also helping to, to collect people's belongings from, from bomb properties and so forth. This is one of the sort of gas decontamination units um, that was operating around the streets of Wimbledon. It wasn't all gloom and doom. This is a rather, I not wanted to include this picture, it's quite sweet. This is an ARP um, wedding of two sort of more senior um, members of the local air raid patrol. That's sort of um, Maud McDermott and Major Alan Vernon Hope being married in 1914. There you can see the gas rattles um, that their fellow ARP representatives are actually providing a, guy, a guard of honour um, after their wedding. This is um, some of the members for the um, auxiliary ambulance crew. There were a number of auxiliary ambulance stations around the borough. Um, so people acted as um, stretcher bearers. They supported the, the standard ambulance service in helping to, to sort of rescue people or to provide first aid and so forth for people who had been, for people who had been injured during air raids. Um, so local police standing guard over a sort of bomb damaged property in, in Wimbledon Broadway. Again, securing premises was particularly um, important um, following air raids. I mean, you didn't want sort of theft or, or further damage to properties. And this is one of the auxiliary fire stations in the Wimbledon area. So auxiliary fire crew were particularly important, as you can imagine, during the Blitz, um, where all the fire crews possible were actually needed, not only to defend our area, but also to, to go into town um, to defend properties such as St Paul's that was sort of mentioned um, during one, our sort of icebreaker session. And uh, local companies would also muster their own um, firefighting team. So this is Pascal's Sweet Factory off Streatham Road in Mitcham. This is their private factory brigade. It would also assist in the local areas where well, you can imagine with, um, I mean, obviously, obviously sugar was rationed during the war, but you can imagine that sugar burns at a very high temperature and it, it, it's very sort of damaging once, once fires set light to something like that. So it's very important for them to actually be there to, to sort of safeguard the premises and, and neighbouring premises during air raids. And this is um, an early picture of the local defence volunteers outside Benninger's Margarine Factory um, in Mitcham. Um, the local defence volunteers was the sort of forerunner um, of the Home Guard. There was a, a request was actually sent out in May 1940 um, and the government had initially planned for a small force um, to help um, protect 
the home fronts, but there was actually such a substantial um, amount of people that volunteered. Um, these were people that were either too old for military service or too young to be conscripted at that stage. Um, and the early forces, as you can see in this picture, had very little in the way of uniform or weaponry. They helped with civil defence, fire watching and home security, um, also manning wardens post pillboxes, tank traps and ba um, barrage balloons. And they would also assist the, the regular army. So, for example, some of the people that you see here in this picture might have actually helped um, at places like the Mission Common gun site, where, which was the site of an anti-aircraft um, position. And this is a recollection of um, a gentleman called J.B. Pritchard of, of the local defence volunteers. He said, I was still at Mitcham County School for Boys when I joined the local defence volunteers on the 23rd of June 1940, age 16. With the fall of Dunkirk, thousands of civilian occupations wished to do what they could to defend England in the invasion which everyone was expecting that summer. I was signed on as a dispatch rider and did my first duty at the Cannons ARP post. There were two of us, one armed with a 12 bore shotgun and two cartridges, and the other with a tin hat. Our sole item of official uniform was an LDV armband. Headquarters of the local defence volunteers and later the Home Guard was the clubhouse of Mitcham Golf Club. On early LDV parades, we were put through the basic movements of drill using broomsticks on the putting green at the side of the clubhouse, where we also did PT. On July 1940, we had 60 members and received our first rifles, USA Ross rifles of 1917 vintage. We had to turn out every time the air raid warning sounded, which was every night during the Blitz, and we watched the heavy raids on London, which lit up the whole sky. We saw planes lit up by searchlights and some shot down by anti-aircraft guns, always a great boost to morale. And when bombs dropped in Mitch and we turned out to guard damaged shops and factories against looters. Now, being in the Home Guard, you see all the sort of Dad's Army TV footage, but it could be a very sort of risky business. It wasn't all sort of laughter and, and sort of larking about by any means. And they had a very important role, which they fulfilled very well. And the dangers are shown by the um, experiences of one particular platoon, which was um, B Company um, of the Mitcham Home Guard, 57th uh, Mitcham Home Guard, 50 cents, sorry, Mitcham Home Guard Battalion. They were on duty at their headquarters at the Tower Creameries on Commonside East on the 26th of April 1941, when they were alerted by what they thought were two parachutists descending on the common. Unfortunately, the parachutes were mines dropped by German aircraft. One of those exploded on impact or detonated on impact, and some of the men were killed as they ran towards the parachutist, what they thought was a parachutist, while others died in the explosion and fierce fire which followed after one of the mines fell on the Creameries. So in all, 15 members of B Company lost their lives last night, that night, and they were buried with full military honours in war graves at London Road Cemetery. Um, this is some more of the, the sort of, this is A Company for, for Mitch and Home Guard. And this is the unveiling of the memorial at the Tower Creameries, um, which was sort of unveiled many years later by Colonel Barbara and the Deputy Lieutenant of Surrey. And this was such a sort of huge impact on the local population. Mitcham was still quite a small community by the standards of the day. Um, and many people would have either been related to or known the people that had actually been killed in that incident. Um, and it was such a serious blow to public morale that Churchill actually ordered a, a median blackout um, and those men, the, their coffins had to be um, loaded onto um, flatbed trucks to actually be transported for the sort of military burial at um, London Road Cemetery in Mitcham. Now, women played a vital role um, working in factories, making guns, shells and planes, munitions, um, supporting um, the first aid, the women's voluntary service helped with running feeding stations, billeting evacuees and, and running a variety of um, fundraising campaigns. Um, here you can see um, some of the housewives of Rains Park being trained in first aid. Um, and this type of um, support was, was vital to help people, particularly those with sort of minor injuries during um, the event of an air raid. We also had many people that um, joined the, the Red Cross. So where doctors weren't available, Red Cross and St John's um, representatives were responsible for assessing the severity of injuries um, sustained during air raid and offering immediate treatment. Um, Wimbledon had first aid posts at um, Pelham Road, over on playing fields near Lindisfarne Road, and also at the All England Lawn Tennis Club. And this is a picture showing Wilson Hospital in Mitcham. This was actually designated as an advanced base once hospitals were put on high alert, um, and they treated inner London casualties as well as local casualties to ease the pressure on London's hospitals, particularly during the Blitz. Um, on one of the 
worst nights, um, they had 37 casualties, um, plus 12 who were triaged and others that were sent home. And it was very traumatic for, for one stretcher bearer, as many of those that he was treating had actually arrived from his own road. Um, and Wilson actually developed a, a very um, important reputation for um, pioneering bone surgery, as did the Atkinson Morley Hospital in Wimbledon, which was um, particularly involved with sort of reconstructive surgery for a lot of those um, injured during raids. And Morden Hall um, was also used as a convalescent hospital during the war. That's a, a picture of emergency surgery at Wilson Hospital. Uh, many women also took on transport roles, um, very important during the war when those who would normally have been fulfilling those roles were actually um, sent on active service. So a lot of women drove buses um, and trams, also involved in driving ambulances, even during air raids. Um, many women were involved in the sort of salvage support work. So this is a lady pictured at Garth Road Salvage Depot in, in the Morden area. And also production of munitions. These are the, some of the female staff from Lyons Toy Factory, at one point the, the world's largest toy factory. So this, were, this was converted, as were many um, local businesses, to um, wartime production. So it went from producing things like sort of um, little tricycles and dolls' houses and baby prams and so forth to producing um, machine gun um, munitions as you can see sort of gliders and various sort of types of um, munition that were actually sent over for those fighting in Europe and different parts of the conflict and they also had a, a very sort of good um, morale boost when King George V actually came to show his appreciation to, to the people that actually worked at Lines, which actually did sustain some bomb damage itself um, but actually continued in real blitz spirit even with sort of some of the factory roofs that actually disappeared people still carried on um, working out in the open air in what remained of the parts of the premises and this is Princess Marina um, the Duchess of Kent again visiting some of the sort of munitions workers at Lines toy factory the land army um, was also a particularly um, important um, type of war work for um, ladies, so they were involved in supporting local farmers. Um, people came from all sorts of backgrounds to do quite heavy duty work. Uh, let me see if I can just find you a, a little um, description from a lady called Dorothy um, Landyard, who was actually involved as a, a um, land army lady. I'm afraid I can't find that at the moment, but she was actually from Morden originally, Dorothy Churchyard, I should say. Um, she went out to join the Land Army and was helping with things like sort of um, felling trees for, for sort of providing wood for, for um, construction work, harvesting potatoes and crops, driving tractors, obviously helping with sort of cereal harvest and milking cattle and so forth. We also had ladies that joined the Army Territorial Services. A lot of those were in, involved with um, driving convoy trucks and military vehicles, as well as providing repairs to cars and military vehicles to help the war effort. I think I'm right in saying Her Majesty the Queen joined the ATS um, as part of her sort of war service. And also there was the Women's Royal Air Force. I don't think these people get as much publicity as they deserve, actually, although they weren't officially serving as, as military pilots, they did actually pilot planes, um, transferring them between airfields. And so were very much at risk um, if they encountered enemy planes whilst doing so. And also helped with a lot of ground based duties, including navigation and, and sort of planning for, for military campaigns. And also the Women's Royal Naval uh, service, better known as the Wrens, uh, provide a lot of support um, in ports helping with naval planning, supplies and administration. Um, and there was actually a lady called um, Jenny Hamilton that I spoke to from Rains Park that was actually um, one of the local Wrens, um, was actually involved with D-Day planning. Um, so they did some, some extremely important work during the war. And youngsters were also in, encouraged to support the war effort, helping with a range of domestic chores, errands, plane spotting, fire watching, all sorts of things to support the local war effort. So we've just got a few sort of pictures to show you the effect of some of the sort of air raids locally. Um, and then I'll sort of finish off with some um, photographs showing sort of leisure activities and things to maintain morale during the war. Um, so there were some very, some quite significant air raids over our area during World War II. Um, during the sort of phony war period, the early stages of the war, people began to feel more at ease. But um, the first raid of the Blitz um, happened on the 13th of August 1940. 
um, and the bullets lasted until May 1941. So 43,000 people were killed in London and over a million properties were damaged. This picture that you can see, see here is the Wimbledon Tire Company, which sustained the first local direct hit on us August the 16th, 1940. Um, and piles of rubber tires here fueled a fire, creating clouds of black smoke and sadly seven people were killed. Um, and I've got some recollections from local people about air raids here. I'll show you some more pictures while I'm reading them out. Harry Woodley says, my mother was very scared during the air raids. There were two underground shelters in the middle of a green between Tweedale and Roberts Bridge Road. Each shelter held about 50 people. We usually stayed all night. And we had to get there early to get a good place. People were scared and quiet, but you got to know everybody. And Jenny Hamilton says there were some terrible night raids. Um, I remember the morning after one such raid, one of the cashier girls arrived at Ely's wearing trousers. Jenny was actually working at Ely's then as a, as a junior. When asked what she thought she was doing dressed like that, she explained that her home had been bombed and she'd grabbed what she could. In spite of this, she was sent home to find a skirt. She said she'd be lucky if she could find one. You had to sleep in your clothes so you could get to the shelters more quickly. Trousers were far more practical than skirts. Um, there was another recollection here. Harry Woodley says, we went all through the Blitz. I remember during the worst raid, bombers were going over all night. I could see the fires burning in London. A landmine got caught in a tree in Tweedale Road. It's just as well it did or it would have flattened all the houses there. Rest centres were set up in public buildings to shelter bombed out families um, and they were building repair restrictions. Um, so prefabricated houses were also um, provided in places like Bishops of Roden on the St Helier estate. Um, the picture you can see here is actually showing the wreckage of the original Cricketers Inn in, in Lower Mitcham, which, which was actually destroyed by um, a delayed action bomb. Um, and this wasn't actually reconstructed until 1958. So you can see it was a lengthy period elapsed between the, the sort of um, actual bomb damage taking place and, and repairs due to the sort of restriction on, on materials. Um, Hume is still maintained during, during the sort of wartime period. I think it's very important. You get, it's a bit hard to see on this photograph, but this is actually Reverend Blamey from the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel um, on Fair Green in Mitcham setting out his store for the church restoration fund in the, the very limited remains of his church after that had sustained significant bomb damage. In the latter stage of the war, you also had flying bombs or doodle bugs. This um, plan just shows the number of sites that were actually hit by doodle bugs in Wimbledon during the summer of 1940. Um, and some of, I think it was Mary had mentioned the, the sort of um, fears of the, the engine of a doodle bug um, cutting out. These were like sort of small pilotless planes. They were basically flying bombs that were launched from places like Belgium and France um, in sort of 1944, 1945. And they would sort of glide over and when their engine actually cut out, that was the point where they would drop immediately and create huge bomb blasts covering a, you know, devastating a large number of properties. These are some of the sort of properties on the St Helier estate which were actually um, damaged by, uh, by doodle bugs in uh, 1944. The people at this particular property were very lucky because although there was a significant damage sustained to the house themselves itself, they were actually uninjured. I'll just finish off by sort of showing you some of the sort of um, things. Obviously, bomb damage can have a major impact on public morale. So it was important to find ways to keep the mind occupied and to maintain public spirits. And local libraries were very important. Reading war magazines and books to follow the war progress helped youngsters to feel in touch with um, fathers and mothers that might have been involved with war work um, and also promoted wartime campaigns, as well as providing a bit of escapism for some of the sort of reading material. Um, the radio was an invaluable source of entertainment, a lot of things like ITMAR, um, it's that man again, providing sort of a morale boosting um, radio shows and programmes and, and classic drama as well um, to keep people entertained. Cycling was something that was um, very keenly followed, particularly by sort of teenagers in the local area. Um, there's a, a wonderful book by Colin Perry called Boy in the Blitz that he wrote. He was actually living in Tooting during World War II, and he cycled all around the local area documenting um, things that he'd seen and the wartime damage um, and, and his sort of experience during the, the Second World War. People used to go on sort of cycling um, tours and, and, and sort of cycle club um, parties to actually maintain morale. Local theatre stage a, a wide range of, of um, 
patriotic dramas, um, musicals and cabaret um, performances to, to maintain public morale during the war. This is the one of the Wimbledon theatre programmes from 1942, um, still maintaining the traditional pantomime there. You can see Dick Whittington being advertised. And cinema was also um, a great source of entertainment. Um, this is a recollection from um, Bill Rudd, a uh, former Morden resident. He said the cinema really did provide a respite from wartime hardships. People went there to escape the blitz. If there was an air raid, we might stop the film for a moment and say, ladies and gentlemen, the warning siren has sounded. If anyone would like to leave, they may do so. Hardly or anyone ever did though. If you paid your money, you wanted to see a film. If a bomb fell through the roof, well, so be it. Um, and with the Mitch and Majestic that you can see there, Brenda Woods was the daughter of the manager there. She said, we even opened on Christmas Day one year. There was a lot of soldiers stationed on Mitch and Common at that time, and the poor things had nothing to do. So my father said, well, we'll open. Um, so theatre, musicals, cabarets, patriotic displays, all very important, as was music and dancing. So you had dancers pictured there at the sort of Stratton Locarno. Um, you'd also have big band performances by... Um, groups such as this is the Joe Loss Orchestra um, performing at Wimbledon Palais during World War II. Um, and you also had visiting Air Force bands. Um, this is the United States Air Force Band pioneered by Glenn Miller. These were actually performing at Morden Park. So very important for maintaining morale, as was um, feeling that you were contributing um, to the war effort. So you had a lot of sort of um, events staged to actually raise funds for the war. So this is part of um, Savings Week, where you had a replica of a Royal Navy Corvette um, being paraded around Mitcham Common. This was um, a lot of towns and villages actually adopted um, military vessels um, and raised funds to support them. Um, and this is HMS Lavender, which was Mitcham's um, Corvette that they adopted. And this is a Mitcham residence looking, taking a closer look at a grounded German plane displayed on Cricket Green. The RAF would actually um, take downed aircraft on low loaders round to various locations and they would charge a small fee to raise money for the Spitfire Fund. And in Colin Perry's diary that I've mentioned to you before, he recalls seeing hordes of local youngsters clambering all over this plane. So by the time it was actually removed at the end of his display period, it was considerably lighter than when it started because they've been wrenching pieces off as souvenirs. So finishing off this, after all the sort of perils of war and all the, the sort of hardships, um, the long awaited um, arrival of Victory in Europe Day was a, a much cause for much celebration. So these are some pictures of um, local street parties uh, where everybody started to bring out food that had been carefully stored for the, the sort of end of the war. Um, there were street parties, sharing of food, bonfires, dancing, singing, church bells ringing, children in fancy dress. Um, and people started eagerly awaiting the, the return of their loved ones from, from active service overseas. This is the the little ones of Dinton Road in Colliers would literally hanging out the, the laundry on the Siegfried line, so to speak, um, by way of bunting. They were hanging their laundry out across the street instead. Um, and this is a picture of a, a street party at Errol Gardens. Um, also, uh, at, towards the end of the war, this is a, a victory in Japan party in Braemar Avenue as well. And I'll just finish off by uh, giving you an idea of the sort of um, atmosphere and excitement of these street parties. This is Irene Bain. Um, she says, then came the street party. Trestle tables were set up down the centre of the road. Chairs were brought out of houses and arranged down the sides. And use was now made of the precious items of food hoarded for just this purpose. In the evening, the adults had their celebrations. There was to be dancing in the streets. A special exciting atmosphere could be felt as night fell and bonfires were lit. There was quite a gathering with a gramophone playing and dancing going on. A plump elderly lady of staid and sober habits whom I knew from church and was a little in awe of had on a smart new dark red dress for the occasion. I was so surprised to see her leading the line of the conga in celebration. <laughs> so there we go, folks. That finishes my um, talk about um, Merton during World War II.